So today we have a new seminar uh, by Helmut Herbert from the University of Göttingen. And the talk is about the role of uncertainty in the economy. Okay. You, you need a microphone? Yes, right? Otherwise, the people that are online cannot follow. Uh, Okay, so we have a, a new talk, new seminar by Helmut Herbert. Here, this is joint work with Alexander Lange, and the talk is about the role of uncertainty in the economy. Okay, we can start it. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, so, reading the title of this presentation, you might say, well, we know so much about uncertainty, about uh, risk in the economy. Say in particular, we know that when there is a kind of huge variation, huge uncertainty, then investors may uh, postpone their activities or there might be financial frictions. So typically we know a lot about the adverse, in theory, about the adverse effects of uh, uncertainty on uh, economic activity. But surprisingly, there is also kind of a theoretical work Say, showing that there is, if there is high uncertainty, there is a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the distribution of business opportunities. And if you are lucky, you could also end up in the positive tail of these uh, realizations. And so there could be some theoretical justification also for an effect, a positive effect of uncertainty on economic activity. Maybe empirically, of course, this uh, great financial crisis has shown that there might be large adverse effects going on in scenarios of huge um, uncertainty. And before I come back to this, how uncertain we are about the role of uncertainty, let me just address some methodological issues that are worthwhile thinking about when, so to say, we are interested in figuring out the structural components behind um, uncertainty and economic activity. Well, uh, Helmut? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> I mean, for those that are connected online, uh, we cannot see the slides. I think you, uh, someone has to share the screen or something like that. Some, that's what Eulalia said. Um, statisticians, we are interested in the, in the causal effects going on between 
economic activity, say, in uncertainty. So we are basically interested in figuring out the structural components of these aggregates on the one hand. And a particular problem here arises because in some sense you could consider uncertainty as kind of a second moment, second order moment of economic activity. And so there is a more or less intrinsic uh, uh, simultaneity here in the data that might play a role for the identification. Um, moreover, when, when we talk about uncertainty, often we have some potential to, to, to intermingle it with kind of volatility. So in this presentation, I would like to consider uncertainty more as the non-predictable part of variations and volatility or realized volatility more as an exposed kind of um, uh, variation. So this is kind of the realized or the, the observed part in variation of empirical data. And um, well, in the recent literature, there have been also made some progress by, so to say, uh, disentangling a bit heterogeneous kinds of uh, uncertainties in this talk, I will in particular distinguish between macroeconomic and financial uncertainty, but there is also papers about political or fiscal uncertainty. So this is kind of the preliminary remarks that I would like to make. And now I would like to uh, name two very prominent, highly published uh, articles that somehow describe how uncertain we are about the role of uncertainty. And there is one paper by Ludwigson and co-authors, and they somehow have detected, as without a surprise, that uh, uncertainties increase in periods of turmoil, whereas it is not really clear in this context, as they argue, if it is the uncertainties that trigger the turmoil, or if it is the shrink in economic activity that triggers the uncertainty. So there is kind of an exogeneity versus endogeneity hypothesis for the, the origin of uh, uncertainty and to figure out, so to say, the, the endogeneity versus exogeneity issues, um, their structural model proceeds from some kind of event and correlation restrictions that they impose on the structural shocks behind the model and I will later be a bit of more explicit on that. From their approach which is highly prominently published in the American Economic Journal, they find that financial uncertainty is exogenous and has kind of detrimental impacts on economic activity. However, macroeconomic uncertainty is endogenous and, as a surprise, macroeconomic uncertainty improves economic performance according to their structural model, which appears in the moment quite surprising. So, so, um, so they are in, um, they confirm more the supply uh, side effects of uh, uncertainty, not so much the demand. Uh, the, de the, the, the demand side effects, the demand side effects are more negative mm -hmm. than the supply side effects because they have more possibilities. Yeah. And the effect of uncertainty on the economy can be positive. Yeah. Um, that yeah, man, maybe could think about this. So later in the empirical analysis, I will only have economic activity, right, and that could basically come from two sides. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite surprisingly, there is another paper by Angelini and co-authors, published in the Journal of Applied Econometrics, and they, so to this paper I will henceforth refer as ABCF, and they use more kind of data-based identification, and they find that both kinds of uncertainty are exogenous, and in particular have adverse effects on economic activity. So this is kind of quite the opposite, right? So one study says uh, and uncertainty is endogenous, the other one says it is exogenous with respect to macro activity, yeah, macro uncertainty. One paper says it has adverse effects, the other paper says it has positive effects on economic activity. So we are very uncertain. In particular, if we take notice of the fact that these two studies employ the same data, right? So they come to completely orthogonal results, conditional applied on invest interest in <laughs> investigating the same data. So what is in this framework this study doing? Well, we consider 
are these two prominent studies. Somehow we do a replication, if you like. And we add additional evidence from alternative structural models that we could consider as complementary to these works. And what we find is that, or what we do is we do sorrow model comparisons, as I put it here. And, um, well, if you are a bit of familiar with structural analysis, I mean, you feel it already from the presentation of this opposite results here, then you might imagine that comparing structural models is always difficult because alternative structural models are often observationally equivalent, right? And so in this study, we do kind of a trick yeah, to provide additional information on the performance of their alternative structural models by adding more data, adding data on the recent health crisis, the corona pandemic, and we look how these models perform during the corona pandemic. Right? And from this we might find some, some hint on which model might be preferred for uh, assessing the role of uncertainty. Moreover, there is a um, prominent critique by Berger and co-authors, also very prominently published, and they say, well, basically both studies are kind of ill-specified owing to omitted variable biases, and they found that when they develop a small-scale macroeconomic model, including forward-looking measures of volatility, like option price, option price volatility, and in the same time, backward-looking information, like realized volatilities, then all those effects that these authors here assign to forward-looking uncertainty measures is captured by the backward-looking realized volatility measures. So basically, they kind of argue for uh, realized volatilities to trigger the effects that these authors find in the data. Yeah. And we pick up also this kind of critique in that we do a second augmentation of our model, namely an augmentation in the cross-section in the cross-equation dimension by including realized volatility. So can you the, the your idea about comparing these two methods during the, the COVID um, uh, pandemic, uh, what's the um, the rationale being behind I will, I will come yeah. to that. Okay. Yeah? So this is just saying that we have a nice trick of comparing structural models. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So what do we find? Well, we find that uh, somehow the results depend on the assumptions on the model. Exogenity versus endogenity can both be found in the data according to structural models. Overall, in this presentation, I will compare about seven alternative structural models and somehow these are clustering, so I will talk about A models versus B models, so two groups of models. And um, I will use an additional approach to identification by means of independent component analysis. And this kind of uh, approach delivers reasonable shocks that occur during the health crisis. And uh, we also show that uh, structural results that we get from this model are largely robust to model augmentation. And overall, we provide supportive evidence for the identifying restrictions made by Ludwigson and others, these event and correlation constraints. However, overall, we um, confirm perfectly the results of Angelini and others, meaning that these correlation and event restrictions here are apparently not sufficiently informative to disentangle our uncertainty shocks. Regarding this critique of Berger, we find that basically their results rely on using a very poor measure of uncertainty, namely this uh, um, option market implied volatilities are apparently somehow informationally poor in comparison with more informative uncertainty in disease that I will present or that I will show in a couple of minutes. Okay, so with this introduction of, the, of this uncertainty issue, I would first like to talk a bit about identification and structural VARs, and then um, say a bit how we can use these methods to understand uncertainty shocks. Then I will show empirical results, and then I will conclude. Okay, so 
Basically, our data, the same as in Ludwigson and others, consists of three variables. We have two uncertainty measures, the macroeconomic uncertainty, the financial uncertainty, and an indicator of economic activity here, the industrial production. These measures of uncertainty are really uh, uh, sophisticated measures of unpredictability going on in the macroeconomy and in the financial market industry. And these indices are, again, as well, published in a very, uh, very high-ranked journal, so they could be considered really informative for these kind of different forced sources of um, uncertainty. So my VAR ordering is like this, to be explicit on that. Later, I will be interested in the structural shocks behind this kind of uh, data. And throughout, if I fail to be explicit about that, I assume that my shocks are ordered also in this way. Yeah, so throughout, I talk about uncertainty shocks ordered in the first position here, industrial production shocks ordered position in the second position, and uncertainty financial shocks in the third position. So this is Later, it will be a bit of uh, important to take notice of. Okay, so here is my structural VAR model. Typically, the VAR structure is here. So this ends up with residuals UT that are subject to contemporaneous correlation. So they are basically not explicit about causal, correlate, causal effects going on in the data. And to unravel these causal effects, what one typically does is that one considers the UT as, uh, so to say, reflections of a set of orthogonalized shocks yeah, that impact linearly on what we observe from the data or what we can estimate from the data. Typically, we assume that these shocks have an identity covariant structure, so they are perfectly orthogonalized. And this implies that the covariance of UT is equal to B times B prime. So in empirical practice, typically you estimate the VAR model, you get estimators for all these dynamic parameters here, and you get an estimator for the covariant structure, which is symmetric of dimension k times k, and so it does not have k square informative, so to say, pieces of information, but this, as I put it here, this linear transmission shape obviously has k square parameters, and so there is somehow kind of an identification problem. Here, I have made this identification problem explicit. So you could think of D as being some covariance factor, and then rotating these covariance factors obtains a set of alternative structural forms that could be behind this uh, covariance that you get from the data. So this is basically the identification problem. And on my next slide, I show you that this is kind of a, a, a problem because, of course, we get from the data unique estimates for the UT, but the transmission from shocks to these estimators here could be quite heterogeneous. So in early studies on structural VARs, people have imposed uh, zero exclusion restrictions like this, yeah, but, or like this, but you see that from this kind of uh, identification approach, what results is strong hierarchical structures in the, in the data, right? So these kind of restrictions have been blamed for their strengths, so to say. You might think of kind of a symmetric transmission here between the shocks and the observables, but this is also kind of restrictive. But what you should learn from this slide is that, so to say, um, what we observe in the data, that is basically um, invariant across distinct orderings of the, of the effects here in this structural matrix. So I can reorder the columns here and the shocks here accordingly to arrive at the same implied UT. Yeah, so column ordering is a, to is a topic in the structural. Column ordering of the structural parameter matrix is a topic in structural analysis. Okay, so what has literature done going beyond these strict um, exclusion restrictions here, and how does this relate to these prominent studies that I have 
mentioned before, and how does it relate to what we do in our, what we do in our work. So, apart from this kind of uh, exclusion restrictions, people have noticed that they might be quite strong, and so um, Scholars have suggested to use weaker sign restrictions, not on the point effects, but on the directional effects of structural shocks on observables, and this is very similar to what Ludwigson and others have done, because they are also doing kind of a set identification that comes from, um, so to say, weak restrictions that are not given in the form of exclusion restrictions. Another suggestion has been made by Ruby, Rubiris Ramirez, <laughs> um, sorry, um, by Rubio Ramirez, and um, they say, well, what we get here from the data is more or less observable, yeah, and maybe we also know something about particular shocks here. So, for instance, you could say that uh, oil supply shocks have been the major trigger of oil prices during the outbreak of the Gulf War. Or contractionary monetary policy shocks, large contractionary monetary policy shocks have been, so to say, observed or realistic for this inauguration of Paul Volcker at the Fed, and so on. So we basically know something about particular shocks over time, and this is what we call narrative information on single shocks, and also Ludwigson and co-authors use some narrative information on which I will be more explicit later. So this is kind of theory or narrative-based kind of identification. There are other sholas who suggest um, structures in the data, particular data features to carry informative content. There is a literature by Rigoborn and Lütkepol and co-authors who have suggested to use informative patterns of heteroscedasticity for identification. That is what Angelini and co-authors are doing, and we will also do this in our replication study. But there is also an literature on using arguments from independent component analysis that says, well, if shocks are, if structural shocks are non-Gaussian and independent, then we can retrieve them uniquely from the data. And that is what I will also do in this work. Yeah, and another kind of database identification trick is using instrumental variables that we consider informative for the structural shocks. This has given rise to literature on proxy SVARs, and Ludwigson and others do kind of a similar thing by formulating particular correlation constraints. So this is basically the whole, the whole uh, toolkit of doing identification in SVARs <coughs> today. And um, let me just go through these steps a bit. So uh, changes in covariance, how are they important or informative for identification? Well, suppose you have the idea that there might be two covariance regimes in your data. So our data will cover, for instance, the great moderation area, the time after the great financial crisis, and you could think that the VAR covariances are different across these time figures. And then, of course, we have here 2 times k times k minus 1 over two pieces of information, right? And this can be shown to solve the identification problem because these two matrices can be rewritten as the product B times B prime and B times lambda times B prime where the lambda is a diagonal matrix. So here we have basically uh, 2 times k times k minus 1 over 2 pieces of information. And here we have the same number of parameters to solve for b under particular numerical restrictions. But this is basically the idea of identification by means of covariance restrictions. Just to recall, now what we do in this work might be not so prominently known and that is the uniqueness of non-Gaussian components for doing identification. And what we do here is basically we have the same formal outline of our, of our structural relation between UT and the beast. 
right? And we assume, in addition to saying that our shocks are uncorrelated, we assume they have a unit covariant structure. And in addition, they are independent. And in addition, they should differ from a joint normal model. So um, in my view, these assumptions are not so restrictive because um, typically zero restrictions, zero correlation in Gaussian models implies independence. So we are not refraining from so to say, is working under independence assumptions in Gaussian models on the one hand. And the second hand is basically that when we do impulse response analysis, then we trace the effects of unit shocks occurring in one variable while we keep the other variable silent. And this scenario is only reasonable under independence. Right? So it's not basically so unusual to use these kind of assumptions in practice and why this approach works in practice um, let us have a look at this slide here and um, to give it to give an intuition assume that the data are structured like this b1 times epsilon uh, epsilon t and now assume that the analyst knows the b1 Right, and the data. So what will he do? Basically, to recover the shocks from the data, he will multiply out the inverse of B1 times the UT. Right? That will give him the true shocks. So now suppose the analyst believes in another structural matrix, say B2. B2 is different from B1. But B2 fulfills the covariance restriction. So B2 times B2 prime is sigma, right? So what will he do believing in this kind of structure? Well, he will take the inverse of the B2 and multiply it with the UT, right? But the UTs are actually B1 times epsilon T. So what he will retrieve as kind of structural shocks is B2 inverse times B1 times epsilon t. But this matrix here is not the identity matrix. And so in some sense, in the epsilon wiggles here, there is joint information coming from the elements in epsilon t. And this makes these candidates for structural shocks dependent. Right? So in this sense, looking for independent components identifies them all. And of course, from the statistical literature, there are a lot of approaches for doing independent component analysis. What we do in this study here is we look at the particular measure of dependence, the so-called distance covariance statistic. I will not go into the details of the statistics, right? And we will look for a space of covariance decompositions and select the particular B matrix as an estimator that minimizes our implied dependence among the shocks. So we use this criteria to estimate the structural parameter matrix. Okay, so this is kind of methodology. Now I would like to come back to empirics, how to model uncertainty shocks. So here is again our data. Yeah, and we use for our replication steps the same sample period as our benchmark studies do as well. So this is from 1960 to 2015. And here is the data. And when you look at this data for macroeconomic uncertainty, <coughs> industrial production in the US, financial uncertainty, hey, then you will find this kind of data quite, say, intuitive, yeah, because many peaks are very reasonable. For instance, here. Here we have a peak in financial uncertainty, which is the, the Black Monday, this huge uh, stock market crash in 1987, right? which basically had no effect on, on real economic conditions or uncertainties in the macro economy. Here you see this oil crisis generating uncertainties in the macro economy. Yeah? So 
this kind of structure is quite intuitive, great financial crisis here, peaking in macroeconomic uncertainty and in financial uncertainty, and well then, the sample stops, right? And when we go further, then we see that this uh, pandemic crisis has also, has also generated huge uncertainties in the macroeconomy and in the financial industry, say, and also kind of adverse effects on economic activity. For the moment, I don't use this data. Later, I will use this data. Okay? So, as I said, Ludwigson and co-authors, they suggest for identification kind of event and correlation constraints. I will not go into the details of all these constraints, but I would like to highlight how it might work. Yeah, so basically, they are interested in figuring out B matrices that establish that, for instance, financial uncertainty shocks are showing a large positive effect on the occasion of the Black Monday. So this is kind of a narrative information, right? We believe the Black Monday has been generated from huge financial uncertainty shocks, and we reject all the B matrices that we could think of that do not show this effect in the implied excitement. Similarly, or maybe a bit of, uh, of uh, uh, discussworthy is this one here, September 2008, the default of the Lehman Bank. Their event restriction is saying, well, in December 2008, the shocks to financial or macroeconomic uncertainty should be large, or both. Yeah, so later I will come back to this, discussing a bit what comes out actually when we apply this shape. You might also apply this kind of narratives to shocks that cover a longer time period. For instance, this event restriction here is saying the sum of shocks to economic activity from 2007 December to 2009 June, the Great Recession, is non-positive. So they reject all the structural parameter matrices that give, on average, positive shocks to this period of the Great Recession. So this is the narratives that they use for uh, identification. There are also kind of, if you like, instrumental variables or correlation constraints, and they are here. And the correlation constraints say basically that macroeconomic uncertainty shocks or uh, shocks to financial uncertainty, they should be um, negatively correlated with stock market returns and positively correlated with gold returns. So gold is a safe heaven, right, and when uncertainty goes up, they, might, they think maybe this shows up in uprising uh, gold prices. Yeah, and um, based on these assumptions, they do set identification. I will not compare our result with their identified set, but will I, I will compare their results with, uh, and so to say, eliciting a particular model from this set. And uh, for this purpose, we use what they call the max G approach. So the results that I will show you hold for a particular model representative from their identified set. Uh, and one, yeah. one question. Uh -huh. uh, in, the, in the previous slide, uh, yeah, so um, the first the first identification in the correlation in, mm -hmm. in, in C1, yeah. I don't think I understand what they have in mind because, you know, to my theorist mind, um, you know, if I think about asset, asset pricing, yeah. uh, when max uncertainty increases, uh, the required expected return rises. So yeah. the correlation should be positive. Expected returns, yes, but actual returns, I mean, when, when macroeconomic uncertainty rises, you could put it away that you expect a deterioration of business opportunities of firms, which show, might show up in their, um, in their uh, balance sheet, so to say, right? And for this, they will lose, basically, capitalization, and this should show up in, in, in a negative correlation between uncertainty and asset price, uh, asset price returns. 
So that is basically yeah, the idea. Contemporary, yeah, the contemporary yeah. correlation is negative. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, here, the other benchmark study by uh, Angelini and co-authors, what they do is they use covariance decompositions for identification. And in fact, they, as they assume that there are three regimes in the data. One prior to the great moderation area, this period of smart, smartly uh, moving uh, economic data. One covering the area of the great moderation and one uh, 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 from this onwards, right? And so they, for these periods, they assume distinct structural transmission patterns. So basically they identify, if you like, three alternative models. Yeah, of course, from these three covariances that they get from the data, they cannot identify three structural transmission schemes so they have to impose additional identifying assumptions. And for instance, they make the over-identifying assumptions, so these, these zeros here, implying that the second shock, the industrial, the macroeconomic activity shock, does not impact on the financial uncertainty. So this is basically behind these zeros here, right? Moreover, they assume that, so to say, the third shock here, yeah, does not impact on the, the, and the financial uncertainty shock. Does not impact on um, does not impact on um, economic activity prior to the Great Moderation, during the Great Moderation. But they leave this effect unrestricted after the Great Financial Crisis. Yeah. So with these additional restrictions, they identify their model. And this is basically the, the benchmark models that we have from the literature. We add one model saying, well, we could build upon this regime system in Angelini and co-authors, but we could consider basically only one uh, uh, structural shape identified by means of covariance changes. So here this um, B matrix is unique over the entire uh, sample. Yeah. So now comes uh, basically our model. So we do an independent component analysis. We look for the particular B matrix that results in most, uh, in least dependent innovations epsilon t. And now, of course, what remains to be done is, so to say, fixing the column ordering in the B matrix. Yeah. So here is our. B matrix, the, the columns that we estimate for the B matrix, and the question is how to order these columns yeah, in order to identify, I mean here it is color coded, right? So if you like an orange shock, a blue shock, and a red shock, that means a macro uncertainty shock, an industrial production shock, and a financial uncertainty shock. And basically what we do here, we apply two rules. One rule is that we look for the particular ordering here that provides shocks that best correspond to the event and correlation constraints of Ludwigson and co-authors. And the other shame is that we look for the particular ordering of columns here that, so to say, establishes that uncertain macro uncertainty shocks have the strongest effect on macro uncertainty that economic activity shocks have the strongest effects on economic activity, and that financial uncertainty shocks have the strongest effect on uh, financial uncertainty. So we look for the particular ordering that maximizes the column sum in this B matrix. Now, so from these two exercises, we get two identified models, and one is what I call the DC, for distance covariance, LMN model, that's the closest approximation of LMN. And I call the other one the DC load model. That is the one that maximizes the sum of the diagonal elements in the B matrix. So that is how we do the identification. And now, overall, we have here two models, right? Here we have a third one. And we have basically three models from Angelini and co-authors. 
and we have the benchmark for an LMN. So overall, we have seven structural models for comparison. Yeah, and to look a bit how these models compare to each other, let us have a look at the empirical evidence, in particular, implied impulse response functions. So as I have said before, basically we can allow for a grouping of structural models, group A models, group B models, and here is the result for five models that we group to the first group to the A models. So these color-coded response functions here are those that come from, this, from these models, right? They are basically more or less similar, yeah? And these plots here are now informative about, so to say, this endogeneity versus exogeneity hypothesis. So what are they telling us? Well, they tell us about the source of macroeconomic uncertainty that it basically comes from itself as an exogenous shock, right? And it does little reflect in its origin, so to say, uh, effects originating in industrial production centers. So these results here are in line with viewing macroeconomic uncertainty as being um, exogenous. And what we see is that when we have a kind of a, a negative shock in macroeconomic uncertainty, so uncertainty goes down, then this is helpful for, sorry, um, when we have an, a positive, sh sorry, now, I'm, now I have to look, Ah, yeah, when we have a negative shock in, no, when we have, ah, sorry, I'm, so when we have a positive shock to um, a macroeconomic uncertainty, then this brings down economic activity. So this is kind of reflecting all these wait and see effects, postponing effects whatsoever. Now, so macroeconomic uncertainty has an adverse effect on economic activity. Here, Regarding financial uncertainty, you find this is kind of exogenous, so it is not depending on economic activity, and it somehow is uh, negative for, um, for, sorry, it's negative for um, economic activity. So this is basically results that you find in this paper by Angelini and co-authors, because these kind of models here, the blue models, are all from these authors, and they basically are in line with their results. So here is the B models. The B models are perfectly in line with the, with the Ludwigson um, results saying that um, macroeconomic uncertainty is caused by downward adjustments in economic activity. So here we have an economic activity shock impacting negatively on macroeconomic uncertainty, which points to endogenous macroeconomic uncertainty. Now, when we look for the effects of macroeconomic uncertainty shocks on economic activity, we see this result. Well, macroeconomic uncertainty is good for economic activity. And you see, without surprise, that also the DC LMN model that is the one that we have composed here to most closely approximate the LMN paper, the LMN shocks, also predicts the same results, so to say, on uh, 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 endogenous uncertainty and positive effects of uncertainty on industrial production. So basically, your outcomes depend to some extent on the adopted structural models. So here we see this kind of uh, evidence um, more in terms of um, forecast error variance decomposition. So we show the, as representatives, the results for the DC loadings model, that is from the group A, and from the DC LMN model, that is from the group B. So here is exogenous macroeconomic uncertainty, here is endogenous macroeconomic uncertainty. And what I show you is, um, is an, um, a decomposition of, mech of uncertain or uncertainty measures. And here you see that this is kind of the macroeconomic uncertainty is kind of mainly driven by macroeconomic uncertainty shocks, whereas the picture here is completely different. Here it is the 
economic shocks that basically drive uh, drive the macroeconomic uncertainty. Now, with regard to the to the effect of the decomposition of financial uncertainty, these two models are basically uh, confirming each other. So, I mean, that is kind of, uh, of course, a bit of tricky. So now the question is, how can we, so to say, separate between these all these alternative models? And maybe it is helpful to look at, so to say, how close are all these models to these uh, event and correlation restrictions? Uh, are they, so to say, are particular, could particular structural models be refused, conditional, not matching these restrictions? So I will not go in much into the details here, but here you see all these shocks corresponding to the particular event restrictions imposed. And you see them for the ABCF model, for, the, for our approximation of the LMM model by means of independent components, for the DC loading model, and for the LMN model. Yeah, and um, say, for instance, here, I mean, this is, this is kind of an interesting result, right? So here you see that the ABCF and our loadings model give quite opposite results to the other to the group B models. Uh, so what happens here? Well, that is the shocks for the effects originating on the occasion of the Lehman collapse. And what you see here is that at this occasion, these two models, the ABCF and our loading model, obtain a large positive shock to macro uncertainty, whereas Ludwigson and others imply a negative shock which might be not necessarily intuitive, but where does this come from? Well, this comes from their event restrictions, saying that on this occasion, either the macroeconomic uncertainty shock or the financial uncertainty shock, or both, should have a large positive value. And what you see is here, in this, looking at, the, at the basically the, the macro shock, this is negative, but at the same time, the financial shock here, that is large and positive, right? So the, the model is in line with the assumption, but here it gives something which is, might not be that super correct. So here you see a particular result where all these other models are slightly at odds with the Ludwigson model. That is, so to say, the restriction that the minimum macro uncertainty shock during the debt ceiling crisis should be positive. Yeah, so here they find a small positive shock, whereas the other models find occasionally a slightly negative shock. Yeah, so basically, overall, we can say, well, also these alternative models here are somehow in line with the event constraints of Ludwigson. So these constraints do not really, so to say, help us in distinct, distinguishing alternative models. They are not sufficiently informative. Yeah, the same holds for the correlation constraint. So when we look at these alternative models here, what we see is that all these shocks exhibit negative correlation, and all these implied macroeconomic uncertainty shocks imply a negative correlation with asset returns and a positive one with low returns. Yeah, so this instrumental variable is also not very useful to distinguish between alternative models. Similarly, the financial uncertainty shocks exhibit negative correlation with uh, asset returns. Only here, only here we see a negative correlation of financial uncertainty shocks with uh, gold returns, which is the case for the ABCF model. So we may be, if you like, could rule out this model condition on this very slight negative correlation. But overall, the event and correlation constraints of Ludwigson and co-authors appear not to be super uh, strong in distinguishing between alternative model structures. So now comes our trick for comparing 
alternative structural models, yeah, which all have, so to say, if you like to think in terms of likelihoods, which all imply the same maximum likelihood of the data, so they are basically observationally equivalent. And what we do now is we move on with our model, with our assumptions, and try to capture the effects in the COVID pandemic. Yeah, so in, in, in March 20, 2020 and March and April 2020, we have observed massive reductions in, in industrial production. Yeah? And we have seen massive deteriorations of financial market valuations. And in the data, you see here this huge uncertainty peaks showing up in uh, this time period. And now we ask, hey, are our structural models or are the group B and the group A models sufficiently uh, suited to capture this kind of um, effects here? Where we would say, well, during the COVID pandemic, we would expect large positive shocks to macroeconomic and financial uncertainty and a negative shock to industrial production. So here is what comes out from, so to say, continuing our empirical analysis, yeah? And what we find is that all alternative models, oops, that all alternative models deliver huge macroeconomic uncertainty shocks. So here this is, I mean, I hope you remember the, the, the unconditional variance is one, right? And the shocks here are five to 10, so this is a lot, yeah? and all predict negative shocks to industrial production during March and April 22, but the LMN model basically fails completely to predict sizable financial uncertainty shocks. But we have seen deteriorations in the, in the S&P 500 that have been histori of, historic of historic degree. Right, and so we consider this result as a particular reason somehow to rule out the LMN model, somehow to rule out the, um, the B group models, yeah, and prefer more the group A model. So, as I have said, we also do an, an so to say, cross equation augmentation of our model, trying to address the critique of Berger and Al who have argued that, so to say, these results from Angelini and Ludwigson, they could come from omitted variable biases in the sense that all the measures that we have here in our model, I mean, economic activity on the one hand and these financial uncertainty, these uncertainty measures here are, so to say, forward-looking and they basically argue that they omit backward-looking information realized volatilities because one might argue that investors typically hedge against uh, observed risks, so to say, yeah? And um, for uncertainty, they use, the, they use an, an option market implied measure. This is this, this VIX here. And basically, they come to the conclusion that all these effects that Ludwigson and Angelini assign to uh, um, financial uncertainty are basically triggered by the, so to say, effects of realized measures of uncertainty. So what we do here is we augment our model by two additional variables, that is realized volatilities for macro activity and for financial markets. So here you see a contrast of, of, the, of the uncertainty indices in blue and the realized measures of macroeconomic volatility in the top panel and here of financial market volatility in the bottom panel. And what you see is that, so these uh, blue figures here are much more leptocortic, so they stay very calm over extended periods of time, but then they could show up, uh, uh, they could show uh, massive expansions that occur occasionally in comparison with the realized volatility numbers, which are less leptocortic in comparison with the blue numbers. So here is, now again, explicitly mentioned our system, our five-dimensional system now, right? 
And now I show you impulse responses obtained from doing independent component analysis in this system. And of course, this is now a bit of an overly large plot. So here is the plot. I choose our um, DC model as a representative for the A group models. Yeah, and what you see here is, so to say, effects of shocks originating in particular variables and their impacts on observable variables. So and the, the figure is designed in a way that this upper block here, the upper left three times three block, is composed in full analogy to these structural impulse responses. Yeah, and when you look here at this picture for the group A models and try to, so to say, figure out what is going on here and you compare it with what is going on here in the upper three times three block, then you see basically little change. Yeah, so here it remains that macro uncertainty is exogenous. Yeah? that macro uncertainty has detrimental impacts on economic activity. Yeah? Financial uncertainty is exogenous and has some detrimental effects on economic activities. So this claim from Berger and co-authors that we can attribute these results to realized volatility measures, that does not hold in our system. Why does it not hold? Well, one could argue that our measures of, of uh, financial uncertainty and macroeconomic uncertainty are much richer, informationally much richer, in comparison to these VIX and realized volatility measures that Berger and co-authors are using. Now to, to underline a bit, so to say, the informational value of these uh, financial uncertainty measures on the one hand and the realized measures on the other hand, let us have a look at the other impulse responses here. So what we see here, for instance, are the effects on realized volatilities stemming from macroeconomic uncertainty. And you see these effects are somehow sizable. Yeah? Here you see the effects of financial uncertainty shocks on realized volatility and you see again sizable positive effect. Yeah? Now vice versa, how do realized volatility shocks impact on macro and financial market uncertainty? Well these effects are here. Here on the one hand and here on the other hand. And what you see is realized volatility shocks surprisingly impact negatively on macroeconomic uncertainty and financial uncertainty. Yeah, so basically this kind of saying that um, realized measures are more informative for uncertainty that is maybe takes maybe not too far and similar results could also be shown for the forecast error variance decompositions of macroeconomic uncertainty, of financial uncertainty, of realized volatility in financial markets, and realized volatility on, in, macro, in a macroeconomic sense. So when you look, for instance, here at the, at the, so to say, results at ultimate horizons, then you see that, um, that macro uncertainty yeah, has a sizable effect on on realized volatility in the macroeconomy, whereas the opposite effect going from realized volatility on uncertainty is not that large. So the 11 here is smaller than the 17 here. You might say, well, that's not, too, that's not a lot, but when we move further to financial uncertainty and realized financial volatility, then you see that these effects are quite strong effectively. So here, for instance, um, here, for instance, um, the financial uncertainty shock impacts on realized volatilities was 40%. Yeah, 
whereas the opposite effect is about one half. Yeah, so from this representation, you might infer that these uh, measures from Urado and co-authors who are prominently published are really more informative than just realized volatility emissions. So this brings me to conclude, and here is my conclusion. Without a surprise, structural implications depend on the applied identification approach. In our case, we have two groups of models, A models versus B models, and we have found that the identifying restrictions suggested by Ludwigson and co-authors are not completely uh, uh, convincing when it comes to distinguishing between A and B models. So they also align to a, to a sizable extent with models from the, from the A family. Yeah, and this uh, independent component analysis that somehow could be used to integrate these alternative approaches from the literature by just selecting alternative column orderings and it provides reasonable shocks to a cure during the health crisis. Yeah, and these results are robust to cross equation model augmentation. And overall, we, so to say, find evidence for macroeconomic uncertainty being an exogenous driver of adverse effects in real data, in re the real economy. Yeah, and um, we also could provide evidence against this omitted variable critique of Berger and co-authors, finding that realized volatilities cannot, so to say, uh, the, re replace the uh, structural analysis that we have arrived at by using sophisticated measures of macroeconomic and or financial uncertainty. Thank you for your interest and attention. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, My question is about which, which is the difference between a structural shock to the macro uncertainty and the uh, realized volatility, the macro realized volatility. You mean in the sense of the transmission channel? Or no, the idea, the economic idea that, uh, from a, because I'm not sure, I can see or I can imagine which is the difference between a shock to the industrial production or a yeah. shock to yeah. a structural shock to, uh, to macro uncertainty, but uh, I'm not sure which is the difference. So, I'm not so sure as well, but um, when you look at this, uh, so to say, uh, economic channels, right, then uncertainty interpreted as a measure or considered as a measure of unpredictability about future events, that kind of triggers this postponing effect, right? So when you feel very uncertain about future outcomes, you postpone your investments, mm -hmm. yeah? Whereas realized volatility, that is what you get from the data. So fit, you fit a model, yeah, you take your residuals, you square them, and you have a measure of realized volatility, which is truly backward looking. You basically don't have a model for, for, uh, for unpredictability, right? And so this is kind of, uh, this also is a distinction between the shocks. One is a shock uh, hitting ex post squared residuals, and one is a shock hitting ex ante predictive squared residuals, if you like. Yeah? So these uncertainty measures, they are constructed from, from a factor approach applied to a cross-section of ex ante prediction errors. 
right? And this is more in the in the vein of this introduction here. You feel uncertain about the future. You postpone or even refrain from doing investments. Another two questions. One is one is why why we do uh, uh, consider the COVID crisis. And the result, you only saw the result for three models. Ah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you missed one model? Yeah. Which one? I think that is the, the, the ICA, ECA. So here is our shocks for the health crisis. And what I have here is the ABCF model from the literature, the LMN model from the literature. Mm -hmm. And then I have explained that we use maybe two alternative that we maybe use two alternative column orderings in this ICA approach, right? One being most closely to the LMN model and one maximizing the loadings. Yes. Here it turns out that maximizing the loadings and bringing the shocks closest to the LMN model obtains the same order. Oh, okay. So therefore I have only no. one model. Yeah? Um. Finally, the last question is about uh, is related with the methodology to identify the the the, the structural shock. Um, if I understand well, do uh, to minimize the distance between the characteristic function, mm -hmm. the the joint characteristic mm -hmm. function. Uh, it is possible because to have the the lower the lower case, which is uncorrelated uh, shocks mm -hmm. and the independent mm -hmm. shocks. And what about maybe uh, considering not that they are um, uh, independent, but the, the, the conditional expectation doesn't depend on the others. On the others. This is more than mm -hmm. uncorrelated, mm -hmm. but lower than independent. I don't know if it is possible to... So as I have outlined my, uh, my, my, my discussion here of uh, independence by means of... Uh, identification by means of independence criteria, I have said, well, these shocks should be non-Gaussian. Right? There is a literature or there is a paper saying that if you have actually some shocks being Gaussian, whereas others are non-Gaussian, you can identify those who are independent, who are non-Gaussian. Mm -hmm. And with your respect to the others, you are somehow uncertain. Mm -hmm. Maybe there you have to think about other identification schemes to get identification. Yeah? With regard to the completely non-Gaussian case and independence case, we have a paper that says, well, if you have two groups of shocks, one group is completely independent of the other, whereas the other shocks are somehow dependent, then you can identify those which are completely independent from the others. And for identifying those who are somehow dependent, you have again to make identifying assumptions. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of possible yeah, to, to look into systems with shocks that are only partly identified, as there are tools to ICA that account for, so to say, a grouping of variables. Some are truly independent under, within each other and from another group, whereas the other group is somehow of remaining dependence. Yeah, so I'm not so sure now about your condition expectations argument, but it is similar to, so to say, having unmodeled dependence in a group of unidentified shocks. If you want to identify them, then you have to do additional additional assumptions. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you.